Good afternoon. Welcome to our webinar. My name is Dr. James Galvin. I'm the director of the Comprehensive Center for Brain Health and for the Lewy Body Dementia Research Center of Excellence. Today, we're going to preview the film Spark, which tells the struggle with Lewy Body Dementia for Robin Williams. But before we do that, I just wanted to spend some time with you talking a little bit about what Lewy Body Dementia is and why it's important. So what exactly is Lewy Body Dementia? Well, it's the second most common cause of dementia after Alzheimer's disease. It counts for about 10 to 12% of all dementias. Now, Lewy Body Dementia really describes two different syndromes. The first is dementia with Lewy Bodies, or DLB, and the second is Parkinson's disease dementia, or PDD. Now, they're very, very similar, largely differing by the, the onset of symptoms. So in Parkinson's disease dementia, the movement disorder always begins first and is present for at least one year prior to the onset of any cognitive symptoms. For dementia with Lewy bodies, it's really any other pattern or presentation. But there's a tremendous overlap of the symptoms. And we're going to spend some time talking about the different features of the disease. We do know that following people with Parkinson's disease, that about 75% of them who live for 10 years with Parkinson's will eventually develop some form of cognitive impairment. Now, all the Lewy body dementias are more common in women, in men, sorry, than they are in women. Alzheimer's is more common in women. So for Lewy body dementia, it's about 1.6 men for every woman who has the disease. <clears throat> From our research, we know that people may have a faster decline in Lewy body dementia than we see in Alzheimer's disease. And so that combined sum of individuals is about 1.4 million Americans. Uh, so this is not an uncommon disease. In many ways, you could think about it as being the most common disease that you've never heard of. And we'll talk a little bit about the implications of that um, throughout the course of this program. The other thing is that because it's a difficult diagnosis to make, there's often a significant delay to diagnosis and then to treatment. So you're going to hear a lot about Robin Williams uh, in the movie, but I, I want, and he's a very important person, and, and, and we really want to thank uh, Susan Snyder Williams and, and the Williams family and the Lewy Body Dementia Association for making this program possible. But, but I just want to give a little personal story uh, to you. And so um, this is my very important person. So this is my grandfather. Uh, this is me as a child, uh, being just born. I was the first grandchild in the family. Um, I grew up in a two family home in New Jersey. Uh, we lived on the first floor. My grandparents lived on the second floor. I was very close uh, to my grandfather. Uh, we did lots of things together. Uh, here's me at my confirmation in the Catholic church and my grandfather was my um, sponsor. Um, my confirmation name was his name, Edward. Uh, and actually my middle name is also Edward. Uh, so again, just highlights the, the strong relationship that, that I have with my grandfather. Um, so we did a lot of things together. Uh, when I was in high school, he was driving me home from a swim meet um, and he made a very, very slow left-handed turn uh, across a busy road and we were hit broadside by another car. Luckily, no one was injured. Uh, and at the time I was a junior in high school, so I was just starting to drive. And I, I remember asking him, you know, what happened? And, and he just really couldn't describe to me what happened, blame the car and, uh, and the like. And again, I didn't think much of it. Um, so my, my grandfather worked for Colgate Palmolive and was a machine oiler. So he was the person who kind of climbed up and down ladders and made sure all the heavy machinery was all working well. Uh, and one day he fell off the ladder. I was taken to the emergency room because he broke some ribs. Um, and my grandmother uh, went to go get him at the emergency room and the ER physician turned to my grandmother and said, how long has your husband had Parkinson's disease? And of course my grandmother had no idea that he had Parkinson's disease and neither did my grandfather. And she was like, what are you talking about? And the ER doctor pointed to my grandfather's hand and he had the pill rolling tremor that was very common for Parkinson's disease. Uh, and so he developed Parkinson's disease, uh, developed all of the symptoms of Parkinson's, the slowness in movement, the tremor, the stiffness, the gait abnormalities. Um, uh, and then in my college years, he started to develop a dementia. Um, and at first he was just forgetful. Um, the forgetfulness got to be quite extensive. Um, and then he started having visual hallucinations. Um, 
And eventually he was sitting in a chair, he's fairly immobile, uh, and he would hallucinate. And one day he was hallucinating and he jumped out of his chair in response to the hallucination. He fell down, broke his hip, uh, and passed away in the rehab hospital after his hip replacement. Um, and, so, and so what is Lewy body dementia to me? It's a disease that really affects not just patients, but their families uh, for extended generations. Um, and my grandmother is gonna be 100 years old this year. Um, and, you know, she still talks about uh, my grandfather and misses him dearly. Um, and so, you know, again, Lewy body dementia doesn't just affect the patient, but it really affects the whole family. Um, and so that's why I think a program like this is so important. So, so what are some of the features of the disease? Well, we have criteria, right? And so criteria allow clinicians and researchers to make diagnoses that are standardized across different groups. So dementia with Lewy bodies criteria requires you to have a progressive change in their cognition, a dementia, uh, with at least two of the following features. Fluctuating cognition, that's a spontaneous change in the level of alertness and attention. Recurrent visual hallucinations, uh, REM sleep behavior disorder, that's acting out dreams, and spontaneous Parkinsonism. There are also some supportive features like falling, passing out, fainting spells, dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system, and mood changes, apathy, anxiety, depression. Parkinson's disease dementia is very similar, but, but a key feature. One is that it has to develop in the context of established motor Parkinson's. So they have to have Parkinson's disease first. The Movement Disorder Society has about a two year cutoff point. So you have to have Parkinson's for at least two years. You have impairment in more than one cognitive domain that is a dementia. It's a decline from the previous levels of ability and it interferes with everyday functioning. And there are a whole bunch of supportive features which are very similar. So the diseases have tremendous overlap. And really, as I said before, the main difference is what came first, the Parkinsonism or other features. So when I talk about the disease, I think one way to do it is, is try to put the symptoms into bins. So instead of focusing on criteria, we can look at the different types of symptoms, how they appear and, and how people might be able to put this together to improve our ability to make diagnoses. Uh, in the center here is some slides on the pathology, the brain changes in the brain uh, that occur with Lewy body dementia. So this is a picture of a Lewy body um, and this is a dopaminergic neuron. This is a neuron, brain cell that makes dopamine, which is one of the chemicals that one helps us move, but is also involved in cognition. Um, and so this sort of circular structure with, the, with this denser core and a pale halo, uh, this is a classic Lewy body. Um, this was described by Dr. Lewy back in the early 1900s. In the 1960s, a cortical Lewy body, so instead of deep, deep in the brain stem, but higher in this, the gray matter cerebral cortex, Dr. Okasaki described a cortical Lewy body. So it looks a little different. You don't have that you know, nice circle with the halo around. It was much harder to see uh, using classic neuropathology stains. Today we have hist antibodies. So we can use histochemistry to identify Lewy bodies a little bit easier. And with antibodies, uh, we can see these much clearer. So it's much easier to make a diagnosis at autopsy than it was before. So when people have Lewy bodies, we can go back and look at all of the symptoms that they experience. And so we can bin them into what I call four categories. So first are the motor symptoms. So people can have slowness, stiffness, imbalance in falls. They may or may not have a tremor that's usually rest at, uh, at, at characteristic. Um, they can have a shuffling gait and they can have a regular jerk-like movements called myoclonus. And so these are all the features that can occur in the motor bin. In the cognition bin, we have visual tracking and attention, visual perception, uh, verbal initiation, uh, timed attention. So anything that's timed or speeded, they tend to do it a lot slower. Um, executive tasks, so problem solving, higher order sort of cognitive functions can be affected. The thinking becomes very slow and the processing speed becomes very slow. Now, if you notice the first couple of these symptoms, visual tracking, visual attention, visual perception, the key word there is visual. And so people start to notice changes in what they're seeing. So often the first doctor they may go see is the eye doctor, thinking that their prescription glasses are not working. So they go to the eye doctor, the eye doctor corrects their lenses, and they find that it's just not getting any better. They go back to the eye doctor, and the eye doctor kind of figures out, well, it's not the eyes, it must be the brain, you should see a neurologist. And that's how a lot of people get their diagnosis. <clears throat> the third bin is the behavioral symptoms. 
So these are symptoms that often have a sort of a psychiatric component to them. So hallucinations, particularly visual hallucinations, seeing small children, furry animals, tend not to be frightening to the patient, at least early on. They can have hallucinations in other modalities, so they can hear things, taste things, feel things, smell things, although this is less common. Uh, they can have delusions. A delusion is a false belief. The most common is something called a capgrass delusion. So people believe that someone's been replaced by an imposter. That's almost identical. Um, it's very hard to convince people that that's not true. They can, as I mentioned, they can have depression, anxiety, apathy, a loss of interest. They can have this REM sleep behavior disorder, which is acting out dreams. And this can begin two decades before any other symptom. And then they have this fluctuation where people's level of alertness can sort of switch on and off like a light switch. And this could last seconds to minutes to hours at a time. And then the last bin is actually the most interesting bin in some ways. So it's this constitutional kind of symptoms. So these are symptoms that people typically don't attribute to brain diseases, uh, but they actually can be quite disturbing to the patient. So many people with Lewy body dementia will have a loss of smell. Uh, they have constipation that may be quite chronic. And again, this can begin years before any other symptoms. Uh, they can have changes in their ability to urinate. They have urinary incontinence. Uh, they tend to have drooling or runny noses. They can feel lightheaded or dizzy when they change the position. Uh, they have abnormal sweating. They have difficulty tolerating temperature changes and they can have sexual dysfunction. And the reason for all of these symptoms is because these Lewy bodies can occur outside of the brain. So they can occur in any type of nervous system tissue. So they occur in the wall of the colon, in the wall of the heart, in the wall of the bladder, in the sweat glands, in the salivary glands. So really anything has neuronal tissue, a Lewy body can appear. And I think that's what gives a lot of the symptoms that we're seeing. And so again, it could be very, very tricky. So instead of focusing just on the criteria, what I try to do is look at the groups of symptoms and use these symptoms to help us establish a diagnosis. The other thing we can do are imaging studies. And so this is an example of some of the imaging studies that we can do. So the first here is an MRI. Now the MRI has no specific findings for Lewy body dementia, but can give us a lot of clues that something is going on. So this is a brain, this is two images of a brain. Um, one person has Alzheimer's, one person has dementia with Lewy bodies. Um, and so this structure right here is the hippocampus. This is the seat of short-term memory. These are the fluid filled spaces called ventricles. Um, and so then we can see the outline of the, the gray matter cortex. So in Alzheimer's disease, you can see that there's a big space here. This, this hippocampus is lost, it's atrophied or shrunken. Although it's shrunken in Lewy body dementia, it's much less shrunken given the level of dementia. So this can be sort of a clue uh, that this is not Alzheimer's disease and could be Lewy body dementia. You see the atrophy, the spacing of the ventricles is about the same. So they have atrophy, they just don't have this selective hippocampal atrophy. So that's one of the things we can use when we're reviewing the scans to help us make a diagnosis. Another thing we can do is a nuclear medicine scan called a DAT scan, a dopamine transporter scan. So dopamine is one of the chemicals the brain makes that helps us move. Um, and the largest concentration of dopamine fibers occurs in the part of the brain called the basal ganglia. So these are deep gray matter structures uh, that are responsible for making our movements smooth. So they help it with initiation and smoothing of our movements. And so in a healthy control, you can see here, the dopamine terminals occur in the basal ganglia. So this is something called a caudate and this is the putamen. Together, they look like a comma. And in dementia with Lewy bodies, you can see that there's less uptake, there's less signal. You can't see the putamen anymore. And so all you can see is the caudate, but it's less robust. So it goes from being a comma shaped to a period shaped. And that's one of the clues that we can look at to suggest that this is Lewy body dementia. It's fairly specific. In Europe, another type of scanning, and in Japan, another type of scanning is called MIBG scintography. So this is cardiac imaging. So this is a healthy control. Um, and so this is again, a nuclear medicine scan An injection is done. Um, and so the tracer is uptaked by a number of structures, including the liver. And this is the, this is the outline of the liver and in the heart. So you can see the tracing of the heart in a healthy control and you can see the tracing of heart of a person of Alzheimer's disease. 
you cannot see it in a person with dementia of Thule bodies. Of course, they have a heart, but the nerves that go to the heart are degenerating. Um, and so you lose that signal, okay? So again, if we look at a colorized picture, uh, so here's the liver and here's the heart in Alzheimer's, here's the liver and here's the heart in healthy control. Here's the liver, but we don't see the heart signal in a dementia with Lewy body case. And so this can be quite specific in the right population. So again, you can see that in healthy control, we don't see the imaging, but in Parkinson's it's missing, in dementia with Lewy bodies it's missing, in Parkinson's disease dementia it's missing, in something called pure autonomic failure it's missing. So these are all Lewy body diseases. And in the non Lewy body diseases, you can still see the heart tracing. The reason we don't do it much in the United States is because diabetes can also cause this denervation um, and diabetes is quite prevalent in the United States in older adult populations, much more so than we see, say, in Japan, where MIBG scintography started. So while it's used frequently in Japan and to a lesser extent in Europe, it's rarely used in the United States because of the non-specificity uh, of its findings. Another thing we can do is look at some of the cognitive profiles. Right, so that we can look at how people perform on different pencil and paper tests. And this is why we do this, because different people will perform differently on these tests and we can use the results of these tests to guide us in making a diagnosis. So these are a list of all of the different types of tests that we do when we go see um, the neurologist or the neuropsychologist. So we test different aspects of memory and language and procedural memory and working memory insight, attention, executive function, visual spatial skills, and, and many other domains. And you can see the pattern for Alzheimer's, Lewy body dementia, frontal temporal degeneration, vascular dementia, depression, the pattern of performance is really quite different. And so this is how we use these results to help us make a diagnosis. So you can see here for Lewy body dementia, they have a deficit in free recall, but it's less than you see in Alzheimer's disease but Lewy body patients benefit from prompting. So if you give them a clue, it can jog their memory. Whereas in Alzheimer's disease, it doesn't help. And the reason being is that Alzheimer's, remember if you look back at that image I showed you of the hippocampus, that seahorse sage structure, that's the seat of your short-term memory. And so there's so much damage done there that people never code the information. So they can't learn it. In Lewy body dementia, people can learn it, but they can't retrieve it. That processing speed is very, very slow. So there's a difference in sort of the fundamental way that people experience the disease. So it's not just a memory deficit, it's how their memory is processed. And we can use these pencil and paper tests to help us distinguish between these different forms. We can also use behavioral symptoms. So these are sometimes called the neuropsychiatric symptoms in dementia. Um, and so this is a scale called the neuropsychiatric inventory and it captures 12 different types of symptoms. And again, I think you can see here the pattern across Parkinson's and Lewy body dementia is different than you see in Alzheimer's or in vascular dementia. And so this differential appearance of symptoms can really help us make a diagnosis. So we can use that, those bins of clinical features, we can use their performance on pencil and paper testing, and we can use the behavioral symptoms to help us make a diagnosis. So when you see an expert who understands these three components it really makes it very easy to make a diagnosis and that diagnosis is usually correct. But that's not how it always happens in the real world. So we did a study of close to a thousand caregivers for people taking care of Lewy body dementia patients uh, to find out about the experience, what it was like, what was the journey like to get a diagnosis? And we found that 78% of patients had been diagnosed with something other than Lewy body dementia the first time. Now, in about half of those people, they were diagnosed with Alzheimer's or some other form of dementia. And in about 39% of people, they were diagnosed with Parkinson's disease or some other movement disorder. So those answers aren't correct, but they're not really harmful because it depends on what doctor you go to and what symptom you complain about. So if you go there complaining about movement as your primary symptom, you see a neurologist, you might be diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And then eventually other symptoms may become more evident. Uh, similarly, if you go to the doctor complaining about memory symptoms, you might be diagnosed with Alzheimer's. So while it's not correct, it's not really wrong. <clears throat> but the bigger problem is that about a, 
uh, 25% of patients were diagnosed with some psychiatric disorder. So geriatric schizophrenia, geriatric uh, bipolar disease. Now, these conditions not only really don't exist, but they expose patients to potentially harmful medications. We also found that about 25% of the time, they weren't misdiagnosed, they received no diagnosis. That is, you go to the doctor, the doctor says, I don't know what's wrong with you, go see another doctor. And what happens is that people start to see multiple doctors. And in, found, in fact, we found that two thirds of patients saw at least three physicians over 18 months before getting a diagnosis. Think about how stressful this could be to a patient who's experiencing things and the doctors just can't tell them what's wrong. Um, it could set the patient up for a number of really significant situations, including the potential for suicide, which you're gonna hear a little bit about in the SPARC program. When people do get a diagnosis, most of the time the diagnosis is made by a neurologist. Only 6% of the time was it made by a primary care doctor. But what was also interesting is that over half the time, the patient went back to that primary care doctor for management. So even though the doctor couldn't make the diagnosis, that doctor is responsible for actually managing the patient. And so when we tested the caregiver's perception of their physicians, they found that about 70% of, of caregivers had difficulty finding physician and knew how to diagnose Lewy body dementia. And about 77% of the patient, the caregivers reported they had difficulty finding a physician who knew how to treat Lewy body dementia. So it's long delay to make the diagnosis, frequent misdiagnosis or non-diagnosis, usually is done by a neurologist. The family has difficulty finding a physician who knows much about the disease. Then they have to go back to that physician who couldn't make the diagnosis and expect to be managed by that physician and not surprising that caregivers are not really satisfied with the overall care. So this is a really global problem that extends across multiple different areas uh, for, of a need for improvement. Now, treatment wise, there are no approved treatments for dementia with Lewy bodies. So nearly everything that we do in the medical office is really off label. So we use medicines from other fields to try to treat symptoms. So we have medicines that can help treat the cognitive symptoms. We can use the medicines approved for Alzheimer's disease, for example, to treat the cognitive symptoms of Lewy body dementia. Uh, we can use the medicines from Parkinson's disease to treat the motor symptoms. We can use the medicines from attention deficit disorder to treat the fluctuation and attention problems. We use the medicines from psychiatry to treat the behavioral symptoms. We can use different medicines to help with the sleep symptoms and different medicines help with the autonomic features. So the thing is that the medicines actually do work at controlling the symptoms. What they don't do and what there's a desperate need for are medicines that address the underlying disease. And we don't have one of those yet. And I'm not sure we're gonna have one in the next five years. A lot more research needs to be done. And we need people to participate in research in order to develop treatments. Um, but the medicines that are available actually do work. So this is a paper we published a while ago, um, it's about 10 years now, um, where we looked at all of the available data, looking and seeing how medicines such as denepazil or galantamine worked on treating the symptoms of Parkinson's disease dementia. And we've nearly all of the studies demonstrated a rather robust symptomatic benefit of these medicines. So they do work, they do reduce the symptom burden. What they don't do is halt the disease. So to summarize, the Lewy body dementias um, are a very common disease. Again, the, maybe the most common disease that most people have never heard of, affecting 1.4 million Americans. They're made of two disorders, Parkinson's dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies, and they differ really only by the timing of the appearance of the movement disorder symptoms. The criteria are very, very specific and correlate strongly with pathology, but they are difficult to apply. It's unclear sometimes how to use these features in order to improve the diagnosis. That's one of the things that our research has been focusing on is what we can do to improve the ability of not just a research center, but of other physicians to be able to make the diagnosis. For the present time, the symptoms are largely, the treatments are largely symptomatic. It's addressing the individual symptoms, usually tailored to an uh, individual patient's uh, difficulties that they're facing. But we at University of Miami are really spearheading novel approaches to improve clinical practice, improve the diagnosis, improve the lives of our patients and their caregivers, 
and to develop new medicines. I hope that you found this part of the introduction informative. We're now going to watch the spark film. Okay. Um, and think about the questions that, that are raised as you watch the film. Okay. Um, after this, we'll come back. Um, you'll hear from one of our research participants about their experience with the disease. Um, and then we'll have an open panel discussion where we'll be discussing <clears throat> different aspects of treatment and research and try to address uh, your questions. Uh, again, I want to thank you for attending this program, and I will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you for being here with us today. Now we would like to start our panelist discussion. My name is Marcia Walker and I'm a family nurse practitioner with a focus in research at the Comprehensive Center for Brain Health. I'm also joined by my colleagues from the Comprehensive Center for Brain Health. Hi, my name is Iris Cohen. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and I help support our patients and caregivers. Hi, my name is Carrie Greenfield and I am an adult geriatric nurse practitioner. My primary role is in the clinic, but I also support all of the research projects. I would now like to introduce Mr. and Mrs. Hathaway, Jeff and Janet. Over the last couple of years, we've had the pleasure of working with Jeff and Janet, both clinically and uh, in research. And um, we've had a great time with the both of them. So welcome Jeff and Janet, and thank you for being with us today. I would like to start with uh, Jeff, if I can ask you, what were your early symptoms of uh, Lewy body? Um, you can let us know about the most common symptoms such as fluctuations and REM sleep disorder, but we also want to know about those uncommon symptoms that may have been just personal for you or unique to you. Can you share that with us? All right, my journey began... Uh was sort of a, first there was Louis. Uh, uh, first there was REM behavior disorder. Uh, I found myself thrashing in my, in my sleep, um, falling off the bed, hitting my head on something, uh, giving myself a black eye. Uh, we went to a uh, personal care physician and I was told that I was just nervous about my impending retirement. I loved my job. I was happy to be retiring to go on to the next level. Uh, we pursued it. We actually found it in Google. We put in thrashing and a number of other words and found it, including a video of a person experiencing uh, REM behavior disorder. Um, so basically, we found ourselves the definition uh, had confirmed by a sleep clinic. Uh, what becomes significant about the REM behavior disorder is we found out later on that 40% of the people who have uh, REM behavior disorder uh, finds that it is, ends up being linked to something called Lewy body, which is about to enter the picture. Next step is the year 2017. The journey continues. My friends and family are talking behind my back, not talking to me, and they're noticing that there's something wrong. So I'll speak of a uh, spark that we just saw. Mm -hmm. uh, you see how relevant that would be. So what was happening was my ability to uh, communicate was declining. Uh, to me, it was a vague sense of anxiety, sort of a who stole my cheese moment, and my confidence was, wa was waning. Most obvious though, believe it or not, uh, was my inability to keep score in volleyball and pickleball. That bothered me more than forgetting somebody's name or something. Okay. Uh, uh, basically, I, I thought I was functioning well. I was balancing the checkbook. Um, I was riding 10 miles uh, at a time on my bike. Um, I thought I was pretty fu functioning uh, pretty well independently, uh, but obviously that didn't turn out to be so. So that was the beginning. So it sounds like you both had to do some investigation uh, on your own uh, with seeking clinical care, uh, which is not uncommon with Lewy body disease. Um, you know, 
patients come in with multiple symptoms and sometimes it's difficult to connect the dots, but it sounds like you guys took it upon yourself, which is great. And I commend you for doing that. So it was a, it was a treat. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing. Mr. Hathaway, this question is for you. Can you please share with our audience today what your individual path was in terms of getting a diagnosis? In addition, can you share with the audience how important it is to get a timely diagnosis? Uh, first, the diagnosis. Um, so last scene, we were um, getting a, a, a original direction. On January 2018, went to my primary care physician and we referred to a local memory center this time. Uh, it's March 2018. From the memory center, we get the message that I have mild cognitive impairment with a suspicion of e evolving dementia of Lewy bodies. I left the center that day thinking that I had a terminal illness with, with which there was no cure. And I was, it was recommended that I put my papers in order. And actually you, Carrie, are the one that sort of gave me a slap on the head and said, maybe that wasn't all true. That's down the road. Um, so basically, Janet and I didn't want to accept that as a final word. I wanted to make sure we got a second opinion. Uh, so we began doing our search again, back to deja vu, doing the research. Uh, we found Louis, Bo Louis Body Dementia Association. We found Dr. Galvin, the Centers for Excellence, and confirmed the mild Louis Body Dementia Uh, at this point, we, we have signed up and, um, and joined in with the center and despite a two and a half hour ride, uh, we've made a commitment to the center and basically we're doing work, work for research, uh, biomarkers, donating our, uh, our brain, I'm not, <laughs> things that way sometimes, donating my brain. Um, so that's the diagnosis. Uh, as far as the importance of the diagnosis, I'm going to answer that in two words, Robin Williams. I mean, look what happened when he didn't have an accurate diagnosis. Uh, what you don't know can hurt you, contraindications. Um, I know I'm speaking to the choir telling you that there are some situations where a single missed dosage could cause permanent brain damage. So that's certainly a, a concern of mine. So key, knowing the prognosis of being able to plan. Thank you. So the next question is for you, Janet. I wanted to ask you what has been your experience with clinicians regarding Lewy body dementia? What has been your experience with the Comprehensive Center for Brain Health team in addressing your own challenges as a spouse and as a caregiver? So as Jeff mentioned, we've certainly had our struggles along the way. We've had some very caring physicians, but also some most of our physicians that we've seen <clears throat> had no idea of the uh, details of Lewy body dementia. Many of them had heard of it, but, and some even said they had a patient or two, but really, we were struggling with physicians who didn't understand uh, the uh, complexities of the Lewy body dementia. So um, his first primary care physician, after he had the diagnosis, um, we had to educate him. We brought information from the Lewy body association with us. Then we had substitute physicians on occasion when he wasn't available, they also weren't familiar with the diagnosis. Um, we went on a cruise in 2019, which was a wonderful experience, but unfortunately Jeff got a terrible cough while we were on the cruise. We went to the cruise ship's uh, medical center and the physician there had never heard of Lewy body dementia. We were concerned about any medications he might prescribe. And so he went right on the internet. He did his own research, much to his credit. And we were able to get uh, cough medicine that didn't have anything that would be detrimental to Jeff. And so 
Um, I think that it's really important, the awareness for the physicians to understand that um, the intricacies of this disease. Um, as far as the second part to the question was our experience with the um, Comprehensive Center for Brain Health. This has been really our most important relationship since Jeff had the diagnosis. Um, I can't express enough how much it's helped us. Um, first of all, the teamwork. From the very beginning, Dr. Galvin and Iris and Carrie and Marcia have all been involved with us. They gave us the diagnosis as a team. They described the treatment plan before we left the center. So we had a very clear understanding of the direction that we needed to take. Um, they've continued to work with the team as a team and partner with us so we can bring up any issue that we might have. And they will strategize to come up with the treatment plan. They have such a strong knowledge base of Lewy body dementia, all the, the multitude of symptoms, the details that go along with that and strategies for um, the care that we can work together to provide. And lastly, they've been so caring. They listen, they're compassionate, they give Jeff a chance to explain and have actually drawn him out uh, things that were bothering him that we didn't realize. And that's made a big difference in many ways. Thank you, Janet, so much for sharing. There needs to be some headway in regards to education, especially with primary care physicians and Lewy body dementia, especially understanding the symptoms and understanding the person and what their caregiver and what they're going through. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. So, Mr. Hathaway, this question is for you. What is your secret to staying positive and living your best possible life alongside with Lewy body dementia? Um, well, not in order, meaning this is sort of a stream of consciousness. Um, so I'm not necessarily giving you the most important first, uh, but my toolbox, um, which looks like a self-help uh, section of a Barnes and Noble bookstore, I think they still have books at the bookstore. Um, and basically my, what I work with in my toolkit is number one with this the importance for us to uh, have joy is to look for gratitude, uh, gratefulness, mindfulness, uh, meditation, which we just did this morning. Um, basically affirmations has been something that's always been a strong part of my regimen since whenever. Uh, I find myself if I'm stuck saying things like, I'll instantly know what I need to know and use it and say that often and repeatedly till I either drive off the road or actually concentrate and get that immediate answer. The other thing that um, I like to add to this now is that I always thought of myself as a positive person. And as what's, what I found is that, you know, with, with this eminence of death idea, um, which I, you know, t took as quite a shock, but needless to say, uh, I'm working with Iris, we worked on something called ants, not uh, as in ants from Massachusetts where your aunt and your uncle, but the ant was for A-N-T-S for an automatic negative thought. And Iris has helped me to realize that I had recognized that I wasn't starting off on the right foot, right foot being, um, you know, with a positive thought. So when Janet says something or asks me a question, she can thank Iris for the fact that I'll always say yes. So if she asks me for a ring, you know, <laughs> then I'm going to have to, I'll have to uh, do something that, to give her a positive thought. Uh, our secret though has been to uh, have and keep a schedule. Uh, overall, there's no, no sense in getting out of bed if you don't have a plan and there's no sense in wasting a day in bed. Uh, so a typical day for us in the morning is absolutely every morning we exercise and two to three hours on, on bikes, playing volleyball, um, uh, we're, we're long walks, 
literally long walks along the beach and, and through parks. Um, so the, the, the morning is very busy with activities like that. The afternoon, uh, we, uh, we've joined two groups, uh, or three if you can count Janice, a separate one. Um, the Dementia Mentor is uh, living with Louie. Uh, so there's two afternoons a week, uh, uh, working with so social workers like Iris. That's another day a week. We don't do that every week, but you get the idea that we every afternoon has a purpose. There's no sitting around, there's no turning on the television. That's, that's against the law before 6, 6 p.m. Uh, mm -hmm. You have to be doing something. Uh, having drinks in the lanai with a neighbor, getting out my contact list uh, for people I taught with uh, and calling them, Janet and I playing Scrabble until it became a little too competitive. Uh, we're gonna get back to that. Um, but ba basically we do a lot of reading, read to each other, we've gotten oral books. So again, things to be passionate about, things to bring us joy. Um, I'm not alone. I uh, have a team, Janice, obviously the most, well, if it isn't, it should be the most obvious part of my team. Uh, nothing happens around here good unless she's involved. Uh, and, you know, Carrie smartening me up about the eminence of things. Um, just, you know, I, Iris, obviously I've talked about Marcia keeping track of all my bio uh, markers. Uh, a great host and coordinator. Uh, it was a pleasure working with uh, Iris, with Iris, yes, but also with Marcia. Um, so basically, I, I also uh, involved in these support groups, and from them, I, I've learned, you know, what is what what does Louis look like? What what can I expect down the road? What, uh, so Louis is a, a marathon, uh, not a sprint, and you know, I'm I'm running along as fast as I can. Mr. Hathaway, thank you so much for sharing. And I have to say from my personal perspective, Monday afternoons, you are my last patient. And I always finish inspired by you and Mrs. Hathaway. And I wanted to thank you for that. I too am inspired. And I just wanna say, listening to your response has me thinking about the things that I need to make more of an effort with to striving to live a more intentional life. So I really appreciate you sharing that. It, it was very inspiring. Jeff and Janet, I have a question for the both of you. We've been fortunate to have you both in our clinical care setting and in our research setting, as you mentioned. Uh, why do you think that it's important to participate in research and why research is so important? Ladies first. Oh, you throw me under the bus. <laughs> Uh, I think actions speak louder than words. I'm here this, you know, this morning. I don't need to be here. I could be still sleeping or whatever. Um, I think it's important, critically important uh, to do research because we can. We're going to make uh, life better for people. Um, so I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm involved as soon as COVID allows us to get back to biomarkers. I'm assuming that you know, that'll open up and you know, I would like to inv get involved in that. Uh, donating my brain. I mean, I'm, I'm paying the price. I'm not just saying I'm, I'm getting involved and Janet is as well. She goes to different groups, but she also goes to a group that um, involves caregivers. Uh, and it, so we're, we're, we're trying to uh, pay it forward, pave the way. Um, I don't know how many different ways of saying, I think you know, research is, is a critical piece. I, I think that it, it also gives Jeff and would give others, gives you as, and me a sense of hope by being, being involved in, in the future and helping others. In some sense, it, it just helps you to believe that um, it's not the end of the world and we can be helpful and we can be useful as we go through this process. Absolutely. I think that you know your participation in our research projects and anyone who participates in research is actually making a huge contribution for further treatment of disease processes, clinical education, uh, future early detection of the disease. Um, so I think that it's it's very important and I commend you for participating and we greatly appreciate all of the contributions that you've made um, in the past and what you're going to make in the future. So thank you for, for being with us and being a 
part of our family. Mr. and Mrs. Hathaway, I cannot say it enough times. You are a true inspiration to so many of us, including myself, who has had the honor and privilege of caring for you for the last several years. You have shared so much valuable information today, and I wanna thank you for that. Lastly, I would like to ask you a question that I feel would be so beneficial for our viewers. Would you be able to provide us with your own personal message of hope? I'd be happy to. As I said earlier, I try to live each day being grateful and being mindful. I try to find things that will bring me joy. Uh, biking, volleyball, uh, certainly Janice should be ahead of any of those lists. <laughs> uh, with my family. Um, I, I want to stay connected and active socially. Uh, I don't want to be the one that doesn't make the next call to a family member or to a relative that, um, you know, I don't want to be the, where the communication stops. It, it's awkward. There's an elephant in the room, right? There's a disease involved and I don't want people to not come see me. So basically, I try my best. Um, I've been able, I've been on the Louis journey now for three years. And there's a couple of people in the groups that I'm in that uh, say that they have been on the Louis train for 20 years. So there's, you know, a, a big gap there and I'd like to fill it. Um, so I, in closing, I would say that when people ask me, how are you, um, I have to stop and think about who am I talking for? Am I talking for Jeff or for Louis? Um, because of what I'm doing most days, Jeff is winning. And I feel good about that. Thank you so much for sharing. And it's so important to always celebrate the successes of the day. Mr. and Mrs. Hathaway, we have cried together and we have laughed together. And most importantly, we will continue on this journey together. We will continue to work on making you the best version of yourself and for you to be able to live your very best life. On behalf of the Comprehensive Center for Brain Health, I want to thank you both for offering your deep insights and for sharing your personal experience with us. We know that it is your intention and our intention that your words have provided not just hope, but a tremendous amount of empowerment to those that are living alongside Louis Body Dementia. For the audience that has joined us today, please stay tuned as we will now open up for a live discussion as Dr. Galvin and our panelists address your submitted questions. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Welcome to our question and answer session. Again, my name is Dr. James Galvin. I'm the director of the Comprehensive Center for Brain Health and for the Louis Body Dementia Research Center of Excellence here at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. I have with me two of our staff members um, who will be here helping me answer as many questions as we can get to uh, over the remaining time of our session. Uh, I'm gonna have them introduce themselves in a second, um, but I just wanna mention that one of our uh, panel members was able to join us today, so she will not be here. So uh, first I'd like to introduce uh, Marcia Walker, who's one of our research nurse practitioners. Marcia, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, uh, my name is Marcia Walker. I'm a nurse practitioner with a um, focus in research and I pose as uh, the sub-I on most of the research projects with the Comprehensive Center for Brain Health. And thank you for joining us today. And we also have Iris Cohen, who's our licensed clinical social worker. Iris. Hi, my name is Iris Cohen. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. My main uh, role in the clinic is to support our patient population and their care partners, as well as support research initiatives um, in different areas. Great. And so thank you all for, for sending in some questions. Feel free to ask some additional questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, I will probably answer a bulk of the questions, but I'm going to try to pass it around as much as possible to my colleagues uh, to add uh, upon it. Um, 
you know, one of the things before we start is, you know, we had several parts of this presentation. We had the introduction, uh, then we had the film with Spark, um, and, and then we had an interview with a patient and, a, and their loved one um, who were living with Lewy body dementia. Um, and so, you know, I, I think one of the things we really want to drive home is this is disease that affects more than just the patient. It really affects the family, uh, affects immediate family, extended family. Um, it has direct impact on how we provide health care. Um, and it, one of the things we really want to touch upon is the opportunities to participate in research. So, so we'll be covering a lot of that over the next uh, half hour to 45 minutes or so. Um, so first question, um, you know, is there any evidence that Lewy body dementia is hereditary? Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Marcia, let her give an answer, then I'll, I'll chime in after that. Marcia? Um, so while having a family member with LBD may increase a person's uh, risk for developing LBD, it's not considered a genetic disease. Um, a small percentage of families uh, with dementia with Lewy body have a genetic um, predisposition or association, but um, the cause is, is unknown. So there cannot be a, a link. Um, at this time, there's no genetic test that can accurately predict whether or not someone develops LBD. Uh, future genetic research may reveal more information about causes and risks um, that you know, may have genetic links uh, in the future. Right, and then that's a great answer. And I think it covers a lot of the topic. You know, th these are areas of really exciting investigative research uh, that are being done by university and in, in, uh, us investigators at the University of Miami, as well as investigators around the world. Um, you know, as Marcia mentioned, by and large, the disease is what we call sporadic. That is, it occurs randomly in the population. Uh, we're just beginning to understand some risk factors associated with it. But to the best of our knowledge, for the most part, most cases are not genetic. Um, Iris, it was an interesting question that came up. And what do you think is the most important thing for caregivers to keep in mind when providing care for someone who's living with Lewy body dementia? So in my mind's eye, there are a few critical uh, components to uh, provide care that is compassionate, calm, and also uh, conducive um, to a quality, a good quality of life. So very, very early on, creating a predictive routine. So creating a routine allows that person to uh, have sort of control of what's happening in their day. Um, also creating um, uh, an ex extensive uh, support system around you, um, not just your family members and friends, but also of clinicians, social workers, um, and other people that might aid you, aid you in giving that support. Um, and most of all, I think the most important thing is to stay calm and create a very safe and uh, protective environment for that person. Great, great. Um... A group of questions have come in regarding REM sleep behavior disorder. So REM sleep behavior disorder is a disorder where people act out their dreams. So typically during your dream sleep, your eyes move. So the R in REM sleep is rapid eye movement. So during your dream sleep, your eyes can move, but the rest of your body typically loses tone. So you don't move. Uh, in REM sleep behavior disorder, this is released and people will act out their dreams. They'll punch, kick, shout, flail about. They can have very, very complex movements, sometimes even getting out of bed and acting out the dream. Um, so we don't know the actual reason why REM sleep disorder occurs. What we do know is that in people who have REM sleep disorder, nearly all of them have Lewy bodies. That's the pathology or the lesions in the brain associated with Parkinson's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies. So almost everybody with REM sleep disorder has Lewy bodies. These Lewy bodies begin in the lower part of the brain stem. Um, and in one of the hypotheses, the Lewy bodies can then spread up into the cortical regions, the gray matter regions of the brain, and that will give the dementia symptoms that we see. So the reason we think it's a risk factor is because of this spread from cell to cell of the Lewy body pathology. Almost everybody, but not everybody, but almost everybody who has REM sleep behavior disorder is at a much higher risk for developing Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's disease dementia, or dementia with Lewy bodies, all three of which are Lewy body disorders. 
Uh, so that's what we really know about the REM sleep disorder at this time. There are a lot of active research programs going on to better understand how it starts, how it spreads, and what would be ways of potentially limiting the risk of developing disease later in life. Um, another interesting question came is, why don't med med many medical doctors know about lean body dementia? Um, and, and that's a real challenge. We had done a survey, well, I always say a few years ago, but now it's closer to 10 years ago. Um, and we interviewed almost a thousand uh, caregivers of patients with Lewy body dementia and asked them about the diagnostic experience. And, and what we found out, and I covered a little bit of this in the slides uh, of the introduction, is that doctors really weren't very knowledgeable. About 70% of the caregivers reported their doctor didn't know that much about Lewy body dementia. Um, and often people have to go see multiple doctors over multiple visits to get a diagnosis. But as a doctor, let me defend the doctor just a little bit, is that doctors learn about a lot of diseases in medical school. But if they don't see the disease on a regular basis, when someone appears with the disease, it can be sometimes really challenging uh, to make that diagnosis. Um, so I'm very familiar with Levi dementia because this is what I specialize in. Um, if someone were to come to me and they had something that I'd never seen before, Ebola virus, even though I learned about Ebola virus in medical school and I can answer a test question about Ebola virus on a test, I might not recognize a person with Ebola virus in front of me. And that might happen for the first two or three times that I saw someone. As I see someone more frequently, then I start to recognize the disease. So part of it is uh, a lack of knowledge about the disease. But part of it is if you, this is not what you specialize in and someone shows up with the disease, it can be very challenging, particularly at the early parts of the disease in, in picking this up. So if someone shows up at a movement disorder doctor because they're complaining about a tremor or stiffness, that doctor might see it as Parkinson's disease. If they show up at a memory doctor and they're really complaining about their memory, they might see it as Alzheimer's disease. If they're having hallucinations and that's their first symptom, they may show up at a psychiatrist, right? And so really it takes a while to see the full collection of symptoms. Um, and, and so, I think it's part of a problem of recognition. It's a part of a problem of providing good diagnostic tools and tests that will enable physicians to recognize the disease quicker, faster, and provide care for their patients. Um, there are a couple of questions on what kind of things could be done you know, to help with the disease. And we'll talk a little bit about medicines, but before we talk about some medicines, I thought it might be interesting to talk about some non-medicine approaches. And so there was a question about um, games and puzzles and blocks and other types of activities. Um, and would that be helpful for people with Lewy body dementia? I'll throw it first over to Marcia. What do you think? I think that um, staying cognitively active is uh, very beneficial. So we always um, encourage, you know, people who come through um, the Comprehensive Center for Brain Health to stay cognitively active, uh, such as playing games, crossword puzzles. We give um, some feedback with some links um, or some resources such as uh, lumosity, neuronation, uh, brain me metrics. There's a, a slew of different resources that can be found, especially with smartphones now on apps and different things like that, or even on the computer. But you can stick to you know, crossword puzzles, but those things that can continue to um, cause your brain to think and, and keep you active mentally, we do encourage. Okay. Iris, what other kind of activities might people benefit from? So there are really four areas where they can really impact uh, the progression of Lewy body and also quality of life. Um, Marcia mentioned cognitive. Uh, I would also like to uh, talk about nutrition. Nutrition is very, very important. Healthful, balanced diet, something kind to the Mediterranean diet, the mind diet, uh, where there is uh, emphasis on eating uh, healthy uh, fats and as well as good amount of fruits and vegetables and legumes to support your brain and your uh, heart. Um, so that's one way. Um, and the second one is exercise. Exercise is very important to stay uh, active in that way. Um, different uh, supporting your balance, supporting um, flexibility and uh, also heart health as far as um, uh, um, challenging your heart with more cardio type of exercise. Great. So another question is, does the protein that's found in Lewy body diseases, can it be seen on scans or MRIs or blood work? 
So the building block, the protein that causes Lewy bodies is called alpha synuclein. That's the name of the protein. <clears throat> to date, it's very, very difficult to measure. Um, so there's no way to see it on MRI. And there likely will never be a way to see it on MRI. Um, we can see the plaques and tangles of Alzheimer's disease on, on something called a PET scan. This is a nuclear medicine scan, but we don't have a tracer currently that can measure Lewy body proteins, the synuclein proteins on a PET scan. There is an ongoing award by the Michael J. Fox Foundation. It's an open award, a million dollar gift if someone can come up with a tracer uh, for alpha synuclein. Um, so this gives you an idea that it's so difficult that, that we actually are offering a bounty if someone can um, blood work is promising, but not there yet clinically. So we can measure alpha synuclein both in spinal fluid and in blood, but it's there at very, very, very low levels. And so you have to have sort of specialized lab procedures to amplify the signal enough to measure it. So there are several companies around the world, including some companies that we're working with that have developed blood tests. So I think it is possible in the next five to seven years that we will have a clinically available blood test, but we're still a ways off. Um, my husband refuses to take a shower and is getting much more difficult to control. But what can I do to help with this? So first, before we answer the question, let me just address this for everybody in the audience is that um, I don't know who's asking the question. I don't know whether I've seen the patient or not before. And even if I did see the patient, before. Um, I, I don't speak in specifics about a person's case. So the answers we'll give when you ask a question about a loved one or about yourself are going to be very general and broad and cover the topics, but we cannot give you a specific answer about you specifically or about your loved one specifically, particularly over a, a Zoom broadcast, right? Um, so I'll go around to the panel. Iris, I'll, I'll start with you first. What were, what were some suggestions you might give to the family to help overcome some of this? So as I mentioned before, the creation of a routine where they know ahead of time that usually the shower happens either in the morning or a late afternoon and evening, um, that that's something predictable and they have control over. The second thing is I would not ask them whether they want to take a shower. I would not have it as a suggestion. I would say, hey, come on, we're going to go take a shower now. So that gives you more control as, and direction to as what is going to happen um, uh, uh, following. Um, and uh, if the person is agitated, I would let it go for a little while and try again a little while later. Uh, don't, don't fight that with them. It's not worth that agitation. Okay. Marcia, anything to add to that? Um, I just, I agree with what Iris is saying, patients. Um, with with you know the loved one um everyone is, is going to be very individualized uh care so what works with one individual may not work with another so um you know being a caretaker and knowing your family member or your loved one uh the best you kind of know you can know or you should well not you should but you know what may work for them um where you can persuade them in ways that you know may not work for someone else but patients absolutely giving patients. And, and like Iris said, if it becomes a, a situation where things are not going as planned and, and it's causing more aggravation, then maybe approaching it another time, giving some time. Right, and, and I would agree with that. So I think one of the things we often do is we apply our regular norms to people living with dementia. Um, and the fact is that their norms have been reset somewhat. Um, and so while you might be useful, used to taking a shower every day, um, and it sounds good to take a shower every day, and of course I encourage people to do that where possible. On the other hand, for that person living with dementia, it might not necessarily be a necessary activity um, that particular moment in time. So, you know, if someone needs to be cleaned because they've messed themselves, then that's a different issue to deal with. But so, so it's time to take a shower and they refuse, bring it back up, bring it up later, right? Um, or maybe offer a sponge bath instead of a shower, right? Um, or offer other ways of, of cleaning one's self. So I think a lot of the challenges are figuring out how to sort of navigate around some of the behaviors that pop up. Um, and so it, it can be really challenging to people. 
Iris, did you want to add? Oh, yes, I wanted to add something that just occurred to me. Sometimes it's not the behavior. It's, it's not what they're saying. It's what behind, what's behind it. So it's very, very important to uh, remember that for patients of Lewy body, there's such a loss of control, such keen loss of control of everything else that goes on around them. So that's a small way where they can assert control on what's going on with them. So let's think about what's happening behind the behavior and how we can gently and calmly address it. So I think that's important to, uh, to add. Great, great. Um, another question, a series of questions have come, come in revolving around paranoia and delusions. Um, and so the difference between a hallucination and a delusion right, is hallucination is seeing something or hearing something that's not there, right? So it, it's, they imagine something that's there and they may think it's real, um, but often you can convince them that it's not necessarily real, but not all the time. Um, a misidentification is looking at something that actually is there and perceiving it as something different. So a chair with a coat on, it becomes a person, right? Um, or a, um, wallpaper that has like a paisley pattern might be bugs, right? So they're looking at something that's actually there and seeing it that something different. A delusion is very different. A delusion is a false fixed belief, right? And so here's the thing about a delusion and I'm gonna turn over to Iris in a second, is that you can't talk someone out of a delusion, right? Because they believe it to be true. So it might be a paranoid delusion that is you're you're doing something behind someone's back, um, you're plotting against them, you're stealing from them. Um, it could be a misidentification delusion. That is, you're not you, you're someone who looks just like you, okay? Um, it could be a formification delusion. That is that there are bugs on you, even though there are no bugs on you. Um, so there are lots of different types of delusions, right? Um, the tricky part is that the person really truly believes that those things are true. Um, and so you just can't tell them that it's not true, right? Iris, what's a, what are some suggestions you might have? So really there are two aspects to this question. The first aspect is addressing the behavior, the paranoia that's been happening. And the second aspect, like I've uh, intimated before, is what's behind the behavior. So like Dr. Galvin said, this is something that's a fixed belief. We're not gonna convince the patient that it's not real or that it's not happening. What I would suggest is to uh, try redirecting, moving him away from that uh, fixation, um, either with a favorite food that they like or an activity that they enjoy. So redirecting away from that uh, um, behavior at the moment. Um, another thing that really helps if, is if it's uh, a similar item, something that occurs over and over again, um, maybe having a duplicate. If it's replacing a key, then having another set of keys. If it's a phone, having uh, another phone, or if it's a medication, having um, similar medication available and saying, here, there it is. Nobody sold it, nobody stole it. It's, it's here for you. The second thing is to see what's behind that paranoia. Um, as I said before, there's a sense of loss of control because they're losing so much of who they are already. Um, and also there is an issue of what those feelings are behind. Often there is a lot of fear, a lot of an anxiety, um, a lot of uh, different, uh, different types of emotions that, is very, that are very hard for them to express. So sitting with them and asking those questions um, and reassuring them over and over that you love them, that you're there for them, then it doesn't matter that you're gonna, gonna get through this together. Um, and I think that's very important. So uh, there are a whole lot of questions about treatment, particularly for behavioral symptoms. And so let me just say that there are no medications approved to treat the behavioral symptoms for Lewy body dementia. So any medicine that we use is what's called off-label. That is we're using it based on our knowledge and experience from other diseases um, and applying that for someone. So, but before you look at treating a behavior, I think the first thing you have to ask is, does the behavior need to be treated, right? Um, and so when I ask people uh, about the behaviors, the first thing I try to do, and Iris alluded to this, is try to figure out if there's any underlying cause, right? Is there something that you could do differently that would eliminate the behavior, 
So if someone's a little agitated, sometimes sort of distracting and redirecting someone um, might take care of the problem, but it might not. Um, you know, trying to find a trigger and removing that trigger might help. Uh, if someone gets upset every time they walk past a mirror because they think there's someone looking at them, then covering up or getting rid of a mirror might be a way of doing that. But sometimes those non-medicine approaches don't work. Um, and so then I always ask the family three questions. Does the behavior interfere with patient care? Does the behavior interfere with patient safety? Or does the behavior interfere with someone else's safety? And if you can't answer yes to one of those questions, then there's really not a reason to treat with medicine because medicines have side effects associated with it. Um, so, you know, a person sees pretty butterflies and they describe the pretty butterflies. It's not disturbing them. It's not interfering with their care. It's not threatening their safety in any way. Then you can experience the pretty butterflies with them. Uh, or you could try to tell them that I don't see the butterflies. Maybe we could talk about this later. Okay. Um, if, on the other hand, the behavior is interfering with their care or their safety, um, then we sometimes will prescribe medications. All of these medicines are off-label, okay? Um, and so it's a very significant discussion to have with the family and with the patient as to whether we want to prescribe the medicine, to discuss the potential side effects, and to discuss whatever potential benefit there may be. The other thing about behaviors is they tend to wax and wane. They come and they go. So if someone's having a lot of bad behaviors, we may treat them for a short period of time and then try to retake away the medicine to see if the behaviors got better, right? So often it's not a reason to treat someone forever with a, me a behavior medicine because they may not be experiencing that behavior for forever. So it's always a, a delicate balance. Um, another couple of questions have come up regarding research. And so, what are some opportunities for research? What kind of research is going on? How could people participate in research? Uh, Marcy, you wanna take that first? Sure, um, so there's a great deal to still learn about uh, Lewy body dementia. And so to sum up, uh, participation in research leads to better understanding of the disease process, including, you know, uh, what we've touched base on so far, the biology, the genetics, um, environmental risk factors, different, um, screening tests, which would then help um, physicians and clinicians to better understand the disease process and uh, aid in, you know, given a diagnosis uh, sooner uh, than what we're seeing right now. So the uh, treatment and the hope for research is eventually cure and, and prevent it, prevention of disease. Um, but there's plenty of uh, resources out there. There's uh, clinicaltrials.gov that has a list of clinical trials that are present currently um, happening um, that you can look into. But we also uh, have research available at the Comprehensive Center for Brain Health. You can reach out to um, healthybrain at miami.edu, which is our uh, email address for any questions or um, interests. And we will be able to provide you with beneficial information and see if, if there's any research projects that we are currently doing um, that you'd be interested in. There's also uh, federal government information just to gain more information. Um, the National Institute in Aging um, on Aging has a slew of information just to, to get you know more acclimated with the disease process and research um, activities. Um, so there, there's a lot, NIH, um, you know, LBDA has uh, tons of information as well. So lbda.org, but there's plenty of research um, and resources out there to, to get involved, um, to help us with, with research and um, ultimately the goal of, of better understanding the disease process. Right. And there are a lot of different types of research projects, right? So there are research projects that simply ask questions, they're surveys, because we wanna learn information. And sometimes the questions are to patients and sometimes to, to the families and sometimes they're to both. Um, there are research projects that are looking at developing new diagnostic tests or maybe they're trying to collect a blood sample um, or a genetic sample, a DNA sample to try to understand the disease. Um, or maybe it's an imaging study where they wanna take a picture of the brain. Um, there are longitudinal studies where people come every year for follow-up. So each year they come and they do this very comprehensive assessment. Um, there are clinical trials where we're testing new medications. Um, 
And then there are studies across the entire spectrum of the disease. So there are some studies that are looking at people at the very, very earliest stages of the disease, right? Uh, and there are studies that are looking at people at the more advanced stages of the disease. So what kind of end of life decisions do families have to make? How do they deal with uh, decisions and, and behaviors toward uh, their loved ones when they're now homebound? So there's a wider range of different types of projects uh, that are available. So if you're interested in research, um, you can contact us at healthybrain at miami.edu. Um, you could look at the Lewy Body Dementia Association website because um, they'll have some studies that are posted there and you can use what's called clinicaltrials.gov um, and that you could just type in Lewy Body Dementia and I'll show you all of the different studies that are active in recruiting um, in your area that if you wanna participate. So there's lots of ways of getting involved in research. Um, a couple of questions have come up with the diagnosis side. So how do we make a diagnosis of Lewy body dementia? How do we know it's not Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease or some other disease? Well, there are groups of investigators who are experts in the area and we come together to write what's called a, a diagnostic criteria. That is, we take all of the available evidence and we try to determine what characteristics or features this are specific for Lewy body dementia versus Alzheimer's disease versus frontal temporal degeneration versus vascular dementia or any other brain disease or any disease for that. Um, and, and so the idea about these criteria is that they're based on the experience of all the investigators and studies that enroll people in research to try to understand which features are more common. So if you remember from the presentation I gave earlier, um, we talked about putting symptoms into bins, right? So motor symptoms and cognitive symptoms, behavioral symptoms and, and constitutional symptoms, right? But criteria actually have very specific things. So for Lewy body dementia, someone has to have a dementia that is a progressive change in memory and thinking function that interferes with everyday activities. And for Lewy body disorders, it tends to affect more of attention visual perception and executive functioning, problem solving, then it does memory, which is typically more effective in Alzheimer's disease. And then they have to have other features. They can have signs of Parkinsonism, so slowness in movement, stiffness, falls, hallucinations, typically visual hallucinations, fluctuations, and these are spontaneous changes in alertness and attention, and REM sleep behavior disorder. So these features make this look like Lewy body dementia, right? Alzheimer patients don't have these features. Frontal temporal dementia patients don't have these features. Vascular dementia patients don't have these features. Each of those diseases have their own features. So by a rigorously applying diagnostic criteria in the hands of experts, you will be right 90 to 95% of the time. And the five to 10% of the time we're not right, we're partially right. And so usually there are two things going on and we can't see the other thing without specialized testing, okay? So, so we can be quite good at making a diagnosis. The trick is to know the criteria and how to apply the criteria. And there's a lot of research going on developing tools to do this. I've been fortunate to lead two efforts to develop tools. Uh, so we created a tool called the Lewy Body Composite Risk Score. And so basically this is using a statistical approach to go look at symptoms and determine what's the likelihood that a person has Lewy body disease. And I also chaired a work group for the National Institutes of Health to develop a Lewy body module. That is a group of tools and interviews that could be used across multiple different centers to improve the characterization, the diagnosis of Lewy body dementia. My colleagues in England um, have led another group. It's called the Diamond Lewy Study. And so they've developed a series of worksheets um, to help the clinicians in England um, make diagnoses of Lewy body dementia. And in England, the way the healthcare system works out is that Parkinson's disease is seen by a neurologist, but dementia is seen by a psychiatrist. And so there are separate worksheets for a neurologist or a psychiatrist to assist them in making the diagnosis. So there's a lot of effort across the world to try to improve the ability to make diagnoses. Um, Another question um, is, uh, what are some of the stages and can we stage people and tell them where they are? Um, so stages are used in two ways. So from a research perspective, 
we stage people all the time, right? So we do an interview, we collect a lot of data, and then we assign people to a stage. They can be normal. They can have what's called mild cognitive impairment. So that's sort of the prodromal or pre-stage of dementia, like pre-diabetes is a pre-stage for diabetes. And then dementias are mild, moderate, and severe. And so we have tools that'll help us do that. So we have rating scales. One of them, for example, is called the clinical dementia rating scale. So we, we take this very long interview and we're able to then stage people. Clinically, it's a little bit different. Um, so you can still use those tools, but often in the office, doctors aren't spending you know, three hour interviews collecting all this information. So we often use things like how people do on pencil and paper tests. So the doctor may do a brief test and then say, oh, based on this score, I think you're in the mild, the moderate or severe stages. The key thing is that the mild stage, people can still do some things for themselves, but they need assistance and they have symptoms that are fairly consistent. At the moderate stage, people are now more dependent on others. And so they really lose their ability to function on an independent level and require people to help them with their everyday activities. At the severe stage, they're really dependent on other people to do almost everything for them, right? Um, and so memory symptoms progress, behavioral symptoms progress, functional symptoms progress. And so we can look at a patient and provide a stage based on all that. The reason it's important to stage people is because different medicines are approved for different stages, right? Um, and so there are medicines approved for the mild stages versus the moderate stages. Right? And so understanding the stages allows us to design a, met a treatment regimen that works for that individual. But it also allows us to think about other things. So like at the mile stage, we want to talk about advanced care plan, right? Um, durable power of attorney, advanced directives, living wills. Um, but at later stages, we still want to talk about those things if they haven't been done yet, but they're harder to do at that stage. We talk about other things like how are we going to manage people at the later stages? What are their end of life wishes? Is there a plan for palliative care? Okay. Um, many families want to keep their loved one at home, but if they have to transition, how could we assist them in transitioning to the next level of care? So these are all things that happen uh, across the board. Um, lots of different type of clinicians can see patients with Lewy body dementia. I would say probably the most common type of clinician that sees Lewy body dementia patients is going to be a neurologist, okay? Because neurologists are trained specifically in diseases of the brain. But they're not the only type of physician or clinician that can see Lewy body dementia patients. Uh, psychiatrists are often called in to help treat with the behaviors. Uh, geriatricians and internal medicine doctors often manage a lot of the other symptoms and they can take care of the dementia as well. Or you could have non-physician providers. So nurse practitioners, physician assistants, psychologists, licensed clinical social workers, psychotherapists, nutritionists, and dietitians. So there are lots of, lots of different types of clinicians that can be involved in the care of patients with Lewy body dementia. It really only depends on what the need of the patient is. What provider is going to be there to help take care of the problems that that patient's experiencing. Okay, let's see, let's pull up some other questions here. Um, is it detrimental to a patient to be involved in their diagnoses? Does it cause stress and fear? Um, so Iris, how would you address that question? I would say clarity is the best way and transparency is the best way. I really advocate for the patient to know what's going on with them so they can be a partner in their own care. Okay. Um, Marcia, from a nurse practitioner perspective, what do you think? Um, I agree with Iris. I think that, you know, being transparent with the patient um, or with the person who actually is going through, um, you know, the disease process for them to have better understanding of what is actually happening to them um, helps with, you know, their progression and, and uh, you know, coping with, with the diagnosis. So it's better, I think it's better for them to understand what's going on and to include them um, in the process. 
And, and I would agree. I, I think first to the principle in medical ethics called autonomy, right? And so the patient has the right to know what's going on with them, right? Um, and so I think it's really important to have a discussion with the patient. Now, some patients with cognitive impairment may not fully understand the conversation, and many of them may not remember the conversation, but they have the right to be part of the conversation. Um, and so in our, in our center, the patient has the right to know. And so we will not hide the diagnosis from the patient. We won't harp on the patient's diagnosis, right? So in our center, we focus largely on the health of the patient, right? And so we look at the, trying to make the patient the best that they could be. And we reset that bar as we need to, to always make them the best that they can be. Um, but at least one time we need to have a conversation about the actual diagnosis, right? And the rest of the time we can focus on the, the individual's capabilities and what they can do and how we can make their life better, improve the quality of their life and improve the quality of life for their family. But we do have to have a conversation about what the actual problem is. Um, let's see. There's so many questions. I want to try to get to all of them that we can. Um, when the patient is beyond comprehending what's going on with them, it might be very difficult to have them involved with their condition. Um, and so Iris, what, do you, what would you say to that? Yes, it could be a uh, challenge. I understand that. But I think at the same time, in every little way that we can give them control, I think we should uh, strive to do so. Uh, so not just label them with this and say that you can't do X, Y, and Z, but find what can they, can they do to give them control, to give them agency over what's going on with them. Uh, even when they're uh, far farther along, even if they're bad bound, there are ways to include them, either watching a TV program together or looking through albums and reminding them of, um, of uh, um, great memories that they've had or um, you know, Zooming with family members, whatever that is, to include them with whatever, um, with everything possible. So another great series of questions came up and I'm trying to group them together because we're getting toward the end of our time. So, you know, can these diseases be prevented? And that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, that's a major area of, of the focus of our research is to not only think about how we could treat diseases, but could we prevent them from beginning at all? Um, Marcia, you wanted to give an example of some of the things that we're doing. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so with research um, that we have been went doing, um, looking into the various ways to pretty much be, as Dr. Galvin mentioned, be the best you that you can be, be intentional with health, with memory, um, with those things that help cognition uh, on a daily basis, with physical activity, with keeping yourself um, as healthy as possible uh, with diet, um, you know, we encourage people to just be intentional with their uh, health. Um, and we're looking into ways of, of doing those types of things and helping or figuring out if those things are actually causing uh, prevention in, in developing disease. So uh, is there a correlation between someone who uh, looks like they might develop dementia, but with doing those activities, with doing all of those preventative measures, uh, will it pose to uh, prevent prevent disease uh, progression or disease uh, to, to show? So there's a lot of research that we're doing to see whether or not there are things that, you know, basically preventative measures for disease. Yeah, one of the things we're really interested in is what makes the brain resilient, that is resistant to the changes that cause disease and what makes the brain vulnerable to those same changes. Uh, and by studying things like resilience and vulnerability, we can hopefully develop programs where we can prevent people from developing these diseases. Um, so we talked a little bit about things that can make us more resilient. So eating a healthy diet. Um, so the mind diet is one thing that we talk a lot about. Um, being cognitively active, socially active, physically active, practicing mindfulness. So there, there's lots of things that, that can be done. Uh, I think the most important thing is seek out medical care, look for opportunities to participate in research, 
educate yourself. You took one great step today participating in this type of seminar. Um, we at the University of Miami Middle School of Medicine have a number of programs. Um, the Lewy Body Dementia Association, the Lewy Body Resource Center, uh, support groups, uh, all of these places are ways that you can learn so much more for the disease. Um, we're coming down to the end of our time. I really wanna thank everybody. I wanna thank my panel members. Um, I want to thank uh, the, our patient and his wife for participating and, and agreeing to be in, interviewed. Um, I, I wanna thank uh, Susan Snyder Williams um, for uh, helping us make, you know, make the knowledge of what, what Robin Williams went through available to everybody so they can learn. Um, I wanna thank you all for attending. I hope you found this informative and I wish you all the very best. Thank you.